All right, today I'm actually going to be redoing an older sermon that I had done. I did this uh, this past year in 2014, and uh, I've been trying to convert a lot of my sermons over to MP3 audio uh, so that they can fit onto a smaller little drive or something like that. You can listen to it on a like a little MP3 player, and the audio was just awful for this study and uh, my wireless microphone system I was using at that point in time, you know, it just died out on me. So uh, the later part of the sermon's okay, the beginning is not really even usable. So I decided to redo this study on a Christian's responsibility to their family. And this is a very, very important subject because I know that every Bible-believing Christian, and I mean every Bible-believing Christian without exception, that I have met has family trouble. Every single one I've ever known. Okay, there's just, there's no such thing as a family that gets along totally and that there's no fighting and no warring and things like this. That just doesn't happen for Bible-believing Christians. And I'm going to show you that that actually lines up with what the Bible says. Okay, it's not that you're antisocial and you have some kind of a problem because you're a Bible believer and you're militant and you're hateful and whatever else. No, no, nothing like that. Uh, this is the way things are going to be when you have Jesus Christ, who is truth personified. He is absolute truth. And when you bring him into your life and you are his servant, um, things are going to start to fall apart with people that are lost. You're not going to get along. So, one of the classic things that you can do, you can turn in your Bible to Genesis chapter 4. One of the classic things that you can do with your in Bible study is the law of first mention. Uh, many times, uh, the Bible will define certain words by the first time it's used. But in this case, we're actually going to look at the first family, the very first family that ever lived. And we're going to see how they got along. Because I'm sure, you know, according to our modern society, that unity and family togetherness and, and we, we, you know, practice tolerance and respect diversity and all this stuff. So I'm sure the very first family that ever existed was quite tolerant and loving among themselves, right? If you know your Bible, you know where I'm going with this, but follow along. Genesis chapter 4, verse 1 through 8. It says here, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord, and Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother, and hugged him, and kissed him on the cheek, and said how much he loves him. And our, our differences are not important because we're brothers, after all. Oh, no, I'm sorry I read that wrong. It says, uh, and slew him. Did you know that the very first family that ever existed, uh, there was murder? A brother actually killed his own brother? Yeah. You say, why start out with such a negative uh, story? Well, because that pretty much sets the tone for the rest of history, the history of mankind. And ever since that first family there started to kill each other and start, well, killed, you know, a brother killed another brother. Ever since then, families have been at war and there has been fighting among families. And see, the only way to really bring families together and not have fighting is to give up on absolute truth. If you deny absolute truth, then you can have unity. But if you believe in absolute truth, you can't have unity. And you say, but aren't we supposed to honor thy father and mother? We're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. We're going to talk about that. But you see, there's this, this whole philosophy right now in our world as we are approaching this time of Jacob's trouble where there will be a new world order. There will be a one world government, a one world religion. 
And the way that this thing is going to work is give up your differences. We all have to come together. You can't say I'm right and you're wrong. That's not being diverse enough, respecting diversity or being tolerant. See, that's what's happening here. But the problem is, Jesus Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And we as his followers have to hold to his standard. There is no other way to heaven except through Jesus Christ. There is no other right book for the English-speaking people than this King James Bible. Very narrow, you know. And guess what? That's going to lead to problems, isn't it? Absolutely. Now let's turn to the New Testament, Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew 10 verse 16 is where we're going to start out. Okay, it says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues. Very clearly written to Jewish people here. You know, uh, most of the book of Matthew is written to the Jews. Okay, up until the time of the crucifixion. Uh, Jesus Christ is the mediator of the New Testament. When he dies, the death of the testator, Hebrews chapter 9, you can read about that. When he dies, that starts the New Testament. So doctrinally, everything up until Matthew chapter 27, it's doctrinally written in the Old Testament. It's in the collection of books in the New Testament, as I've said in other studies. But it is doctrinally in the Old Testament. He's writing to Jews. That's why he's talking about synagogues. Verse 18, And ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what ye shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what ye shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death. Where did we just read about that? Cain and Abel? The very first family? Old things have changed, Brian. It's, it's getting better. It's, it's, you don't understand, Brian. There's, there's evolution. We're spiritually evolving. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't think so. Um, I live in reality. All right. I don't live in the fantasy land of thinking that things are getting better. They're not. And that even goes against science, by the way, the second law of thermodynamics. But another story. And the father, the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. Now this is obviously very clearly written to Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. The coming seven year period that's coming up that's written a lot about in the book of Daniel, in the Old Testament, in the book of Revelation, in the New Testament. Uh, that's what the two books that really describe this coming time. And of course, the, the actual statement there, the title, The Time of Jacob's Trouble, appears in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. And that is the true title. It is not called the Great Tribulation. Okay, that's a false teaching that's been perpetuated for a very long time. You see other studies on that. But you see here this thing of this time period, family members are actually going to be turning each other in to be executed. Um, does that kind of thing happen today? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Many of you have been threatened by your family members, haven't you? Mm -hmm. I have. My wife has. Yeah. Sure, absolutely. We're getting very close to this time period. You say, well, what's, the, what's the cause, there, Brian? Why are, they, why are these families turning on each other like this? Well, look at, uh, jump down to verse 34 there in Matthew chapter 10, and you're going to see the reason why. It says here in verse 34 through 36, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. 
and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Hmm. I find it rather interesting that uh, Jesus sends a certain thing upon the earth and it causes division. Uh, what is it? You say, well, it's a, uh, it's a sword. Like this one. That's a sword. And it's a real one too, by the way. This thing's very sharp. I'm not going to mess around with it. This is a real sword. But this isn't what Jesus is talking about. This is. More wars, more blood has been spilled. More wars have been fought, more blood has been spilled over this book than all of these in the history of man. This is the tool of warfare. Yes, that's true. But this is often the cause of it. You say, well, then the Bible's a terrible book. No, the Bible's a good book. Men just misinterpret it. Men just take it and twist it to use it for their own goals and their own purposes. And men will counterfeit this book. The counterfeits appear as the uh, Koran, the Book of Mormon, uh, a lot of the rules and things like this, traditions of men. The uh, Catechism of the Catholic Church. And of course the myriads of Roman Catholic perversions. I have one here on my table from another video I did. The New American Bible. Not even from the same part of the world. If you don't know about the issue, the King James Bible version issue, this one here comes from Antioch in Syria. This one comes from Alexandria, Alexandria Egypt. Excuse me. This thing has other books in it that this one doesn't have. They say, well, the, you know, the, the Bibles are all the same thing. They pretty much say the same thing. Oh, no, they don't. Oh, no, they don't. They say quite different things. And this family over here is the same one that produced the New American Standard Version, the English Standard Version. Many of the readings within the New King James Version, the NIV, the New Living Translation, all the garbage. That's this family over here. Jesus Christ came and he brought a sword Okay, John 17, verse 17 says, sanctify, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You know what splits people up? Truth. Truth is divisive. Truth always will be divisive. So what's the way that you bring people together? But by denying truth. You have to deny the book. You have to get rid of the sword. You have to... Uh, Disarm people. You don't want things like this being in the hands of the people. Especially when it's the spiritual. See how that works? But let's... If you're there, I closed my Bible, but if you're still there in Matthew chapter 10, we're going to keep reading here. Verse 37 through 39. But you say, you know, okay, but... I mean, I find, I find this symbology here, this thing of the sword, I find this to be very highly offensive. I mean, I mean, shouldn't we just compromise? I mean, do we have to be so dogmatic and so, so, such Bible thumpers, you know? I mean, living by the Bible and everything has to be in the Bible or else we don't believe it, you know? Let's look about that. Verse 37, you say, you know, shouldn't we just focus on the love of Jesus? Let's see what Jesus has to say about that. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Have you lost your life for Jesus Christ? You say, well, you know, I don't think I'm that bad of a person. Okay. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Are you a sinner? Well, I don't know. I guess, we, I guess we're all sinners, but I'm not that bad. Do you have relatives like that? I'm a good person. I go to church. I volunteer. I do lots of good things. Community service. Well, hey, what about the absolute truth of this book? You know, this book condemns what you're doing. That, who are you to judge me? Just like that. That... Uh, good person will all of a sudden turn on you. You know why? Because you're bringing division. Because of a sword. You see? 
You know, if you take this thing here and you hit something with it, it's going to cut it. There's really no way to uh, play with this thing. You know, if you have little children, you don't want to leave these things laying around, you know, a razor sharp sword like this. Why? Because it cuts. You don't want to have things like this at a family get together where there's lots of little children. And, you know, uh, the Bible talks about lost people being the children of disobedience. They don't like something like this because it cuts them. It's kind of funny, too, because when you start to quote scripture to lost people, they'll say, stop cutting on me. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, well, I guess I am cutting on you. Actually, it's not me. It's the sword of the spirit that's doing it. So, but let's continue. Uh, Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, verse 25 through 33. And by the way, I purposefully did not watch the other study, you know, that I did earlier, not quite a year ago. I purposefully decided not to watch it because I didn't, I just thought I'm just going to get the notes out and I'm going to preach it the way the Lord wants me to preach it. I'm not going to try to do a repeat and try to say exactly what I said in the first one. So that's just the way it's going to be. Luke chapter 14, verse 25 through 33. It says here, and, they, and there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? lest haply after he hath laid the foundation and is, and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man begin to build, began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand? Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an embassage, and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. If you really truly want to follow Jesus Christ, you have to be willing to put everything that you have on the altar. I'm not saying that you have to go up to your, you know, knock on your uh, family members' doors and they don't come to the door and say, hey, how you doing? I, say, I hate you. And turn around and walk away. <laughs> no, you don't have to do that. It's not, it's not saying... Jesus is not saying you have to you have to hate them and just be mean to them and whatever else. It's just simply saying when you put something between you and the Lord that you love greater than the Lord, that's a problem. You can't be the disciple of Jesus when you're doing that. What you have to do is you have to simply say, I'm not going to love my parents or my brother or my sister or even your children or, you know, it says right there, um, your wife, you know. I can't put anybody between myself and the Lord Jesus Christ if I expect to be his disciple. Now, when my wife is submissive to the word of God and she's doing the will of God and things like that, okay, I can love her. That's fine. And, I, and I'm, you know, I'm there and I'm, I'm always going to love her and be her husband. But the point is, if she starts to do things that, that are contrary to the word of God and tries to take me away from ministry... Jesus Christ comes first. See? And if my family members are trying to tell me to do things that are contrary to Scripture, Jesus Christ comes first. That's just the way it's going to be. I must forsake all to follow Jesus. You know, there's a, a neat little acronym, FAITH. I don't know if you ever heard this before, but FAITH is forsaking all I trust Him. F-A-I-T-H, you know, interesting. And if you have faith, the just shall live by faith, you are going to have to forsake all. See, that's, you know, it's easy to say, oh, yeah, I have faith that Jesus died for my sins. Do you have faith that he can provide for you? Do you have faith that he will stand by you when your family turns against you? Hmm. Do you have faith that his word is true? 
when these uh, Alexandrian perverts come to you with these new versions and they say, actually, the King James Bible is an error here, here, and here, and here. It was this, it was that. Are you going to maintain your faith? Or are you going to quit? Because you see, what these people over here want you to do, this Catholic system over here, the Vatican Bible that comes out in so many different forms, hundreds of different forms, you know, with this side, what they want you to do, they want you to put your sword down. They don't like it. They don't like getting cut by this sword right here, the King James Bible. You know, I mean, it even says in the beginning, the, the preface to a, a King James Bible, they don't all include it, but the preface it says here, let me just flip to it real quick. I mean, it pretty much just comes right out and says it. So that if on the one side we shall be traduced by popish persons at home or abroad, who therefore will malign us, because we are poor instruments to make God's holy truth to be yet more and more known unto the people, uh, whom they desire still to keep in, in ignorance and darkness. Okay? So, right there, it's talking about popish persons. So, right in the uh, epistle dedicatory, that's what it is, not the preface, but the epistle dedicatory, it actually comes out and slams Catholics. Popish persons. <laughs> you know? That's why the Catholics don't like this book. That's why they've tried to replace it. They know they can't destroy the King James Bible, so the next best thing is to try and replace it. That's what they do. But again, you see there this thing of counting the cost. And like it was talking about there in these other verses there, verses 28 down through 32, it's talking about counting the cost. And you know one of the most pathetic things too, by the way, is when you come out and you say you're a King James Bible believer, but you don't really count the cost, and all of a sudden you see that your family members are turning against you, and you back off. You say, well, you know, I guess I could just use a new version occasionally. Maybe it's not so bad using a new version and and I guess I can continue going to that Babel building that I know is wrong and whatever. And you compromise. You compromise the truth. You know what you did? You didn't count the cost before you went into the war, before you try to pick up the sword of the Spirit. You better count the cost. Otherwise, you're not going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Next, turn to Matthew chapter 24, verse 12. in the wrong direction here. Matthew chapter 24, verse 12. There's another very interesting thing here. Jesus Christ prophesying of the end times. Uh, he says here in Matthew 24, verse 12, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. You know, a lot of the family arguments that are there today didn't even exist a hundred years ago. I mean, a hundred years ago, who was watching television? in uh, 1915. There wasn't any television back then. A hundred years ago, uh, who was fighting over different things about cars, being in debt to a car, being in debt to the banks and things like that? People really weren't much debt back then, if, if any debt at all. And, you know, cell phones and, and, I mean, just the whole entertainment industry, you know, you get witchcraft and, and I mean, just vampires and Satanism just all over the place, rock music, rap music, all this garbage music, you know, that stuff didn't even exist a hundred years ago and on back through, you know, no, it was in different forms and whatever, but I'm saying in popular media, it wasn't there, it wasn't a problem. So what happens in the end times, iniquity abounds and what happens as a result? The love of many shall wax cold. And, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, right now, there's a lot of things that you could, quote-unquote, compromise over back in the past. You know, um, you go to a family member's house and, and, you know, they're out back smoking a cigar or something like that. And you say, hey, I don't want that around my children. Well, okay, you know, whatever and, and stuff. But the women would have been dressed modestly. They would not have been talking about, you know, uh, you know, a lot of the television stuff and whatever else. You know, people were fairly clean back in the 1800s. Even the most lost person back then had better morals than a lot of saved people do today. So you could be around your lost relatives a little bit more back then. But now, 
I mean, if you want to live any kind of a separated Christian life, there are relatives you cannot be in their presence. They live filthy. And many of them are professing Christians too, I might add. I mean, I can't get near, you know, I go around, you know, people that I've known and stuff like that. I mean, we live in a different state now, so we don't see relatives anymore. But, you know, I get around, I used to be around relatives, and it was like I had to walk out of the house because they got television on, and television is so vexing, it's just disgusting. I can't even be in the same room as the thing anymore. You know, I mean, the mind control of it is just insane. So, again, the Bible is true. And see, so, you know, you show this to a lost relative and you try to explain to them, hey, I can't be around you when you're doing this stuff because there's a lot of iniquity that's abounding in your life. You're cutting on them. They're not going to like that. And they're going to say, but we're family. You have to be with us. We're family. Uh, I don't care. <laughs> you know, my relationship to Jesus Christ is more important than my family. But what about instructions for us today? Okay. Because we've seen there what the Lord says about things like this. This thing of family and whatever. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 29 through 33. All right. Let's read here. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 29 says, But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none, and they that weep as though they wept not, and they that rejoice as though they rejoiced not, and they that buy as though they possessed not, and they that use this world as not abusing it, for the fashion of this world passeth away. But I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. Okay? Now, it's not saying forsake your wife so that you can be in ministry. No, no, it's not saying that. But what the whole thing is, there are married people out there, and I will say this, there are married people that one is saved, one is lost. And you're going to be leaving them at some point in time if they don't get saved before the rapture. Okay? When the rapture hits, you're leaving. So you better make sure that they don't drag you down into the cesspool that is the, the current popular trends of the world. Don't start watching TV with them and whatever else. Hey, if you're married to a lost person, and I know some of you are and things, I've, I, I know some of the, my viewers here, you are and you struggle with it and you pray about it and everything else, but time is short. And explain to them, about this stuff, and I know many of you have, but I'm just saying, keep it up. Just stay encouraged, because time is very short, and if they really love you, they need to understand you're going to be leaving at some point in time, and they're going to be left behind to face God's wrath for seven years, okay? Uh, you don't want to do that, right? They don't want to do that, I should say. But even if you're saved, even if you're saved, one of the most important things that you can do as, as a saved couple is to encourage one another, exhort one another, to constantly be there saying, let's, let's stay in the fight. Let's, let's keep going. Jesus is coming soon. Let's not get sidetracked with a bunch of other stuff. Let's, let's form our own little family unit here. We don't need to go to family get-togethers and class reunions and, and whatever else. Okay, if we can go and we can be around family members and they're not going to be overly offensive and cause us to, to get in trouble with the Lord and whatever else, okay, fine. But if they're going to, you know, iniquity, abound in iniquity, if there's all kinds of sin there and it's just going to hurt us spiritually, then we're just going to have to respectfully say, hey, I'm sorry. I can't be around you right now. You don't respect my religious beliefs. That's just the way it's going to have to be. The time is short, brethren. And, in, and as the, the more time gets shortened and shortened and shortened until the Lord takes us out of here, the more iniquity is going to abound. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. It's going to get worse. You say, well, then we just give up on our family members, our lost family members. No, I didn't say that. Warn them. Tell them. 
But if they get to a point, and I'm going to be talking about this a little bit later, when they get to a point where they've made their decision and they're just like, you know, like Luther, Martin Luther said, here I stand, God help me, <laughs> you know. And you get these lost relatives and they're like that, you know. I'm standing right here. I'm not going to change. You need to change and come back to me. No, we're not going to do it that way. Sorry. But interestingly, you know, family is such an important thing. Oh, it's so important. Uh, did you know that there's only one reference to the word family in the New Testament? Why don't we look it up, see what it says. Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10 through 19. It says here, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. What family do you think he's talking about? Well, let's keep reading. Verse 16, That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, there's a whole lot that I could say about this passage. But the fact of the matter is, verse 18, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. What is that? Well, the Bible says that Christ Jesus is our foundation. And we are built up as lively stones. What's it talking about? This passage right here, the one reference to the word family, is talking about your eternal family. And we are to comprehend and keep it in mind about our saved brothers and sisters in Christ. And not only the ones that are still, or that are alive today, but those that are in heaven right now. Like we saw there in uh, verse 15, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. When are we going to have that reunion? When the dead in Christ rise first, then we which are alive and remain are caught up together. The redemption of the purchased possession. We're going to have a family reunion. And we're going to get there to be with our family. And when we're with the Lord, then we shall know even as we are also known. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Meaning, when we get there, we're all going to think the same. It's going to be the ultimate family reunion. All those saved brothers and sisters down through the centuries. I mean, can you imagine? I know I talk about this a lot, but it's because I'm looking forward to it. you know. And all the false converts that are out there that give us such a rough time as Bible-believing Christians, you know, tell us, oh, we should be nicer to the Catholics and, and we should compromise and we shouldn't. We shouldn't be so divisive with our King James Bibles, you know. Those people, they're going to get left behind. They're like the, the Laodiceans that are neither cold nor hot, back in Revelation chapter 3, and God spews them out of his mouth. Why? Because they're foreign matter in his stomach. They look like they're part of the body, but they're just foreign matter in the stomach. They get spewed out at the rapture. It's the false converts. The truly saved go up. Okay, And I'm not saying the false converts are saved, but then they lose their salvation or something. No, no, no. They were never truly saved. They never came to God in that repentant, contrite, broken spirit of being a true sinner, of saying, I'm no good. God, please save me. You know, And then God saves them, and then their life goes on from there. So these false converts are done. They're gone. They're finished. They're going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble. And those who are truly saved are going to have this great reunion up in the clouds before we meet the Lord. And it's really going to be amazing. I mean, can you imagine? We get up there, 
all of us here on YouTube that are saved are going to see each other for the first time and never like, oh, yeah, well, it's nice to see you. Well, I got to get back to work here. I got to go back, get my taxes done or got to go, you know, uh, whatever, you know. I mean, we're going to be there. We're done. We're finished with the, the sin and the temptation and everything else that we have here on earth. It's just going to be so wonderful. And then we look around. Hey, there's Paul. Hey, Paul. You know, there's D.L. Moody. Hey, you know, Dwight. Hey, brother. You know, there's all these other heroes of the faith and things. There's Mary. Hi, Mary. You know, she's like, hey, you know, just another Christian. You know, not Holy Mary, Mother of God. No, she's just Mary. Hi, Mary. You know, <laughs> it's going to be wonderful. And that's what we need to comprehend. That's what you need to keep in mind. That's the family that you need to be concerned about. Exhorting that family and saying, hey, I'm praying for you. Hey, can I help you out with this? Hey, can I show you this? Or can I get, you know, and exhorting one another. And see, right now, the reason we're still here on earth is because the uh, breadth and length and, and uh, depth and height isn't complete yet. Now the Lord has his timing. He has things figured out. But right now, there's still an open door. You know, and I get comments and things and I get people and they say, you know, Brian, I've been watching you for years and I'm not really a Christian or anything, but I, I do appreciate what you're trying to put out. Man, what are you waiting for? Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I didn't quote it perfectly there, but you can look that up. You better get saved. You know, don't fool around much longer, okay? You don't want to be left here for what's coming. But let's go to Matthew chapter 12. Next. Matthew chapter 12. Beginning, beginning in verse 46. We'll see here how uh, Jesus handled his family. Matthew chapter 12, verse 46 through 50. While he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren, yes, he had brothers, physical brothers, stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold my mother and my brethren, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Now, when I gave my life to Jesus Christ, I got saved, and then the Lord called me into the ministry. And I began to serve the Lord on a full-time basis. And I gave up family connections and things and, and I have family members that haven't even talked to me in years so whatever you know when I gave that stuff up I became a disciple of Jesus Christ so according to verse 50 there whosoever shall do the will of my father which is in heaven the same as my bro bro brother excuse me and sister and mother so guess what you say uh, I believe in the holy holy mother of God or whatever else well then you're believing in me <laughs> what are you talking about well, right there, I'm doing the will of the Father, so I'm his mother. What? <laughs> you know, uh, for all the Catholics out there, I just had to insert that. If you're doing the will of the Lord, if you're saved and you're doing the will of the Lord, you're his family. And again, Mary does not have a special place. I mean, he didn't drop everything and say, oh, Mary, oh, Mary, the mother of God is outside? Oh, you know, and you see these Catholic advertisements, you know, Jesus never said no to his mother. Uh, that... Sounds like he did right there, you know. And he wasn't being disrespectful. He was just saying simply, hey, you know, my disciples, they're my family. To illustrate the point of the body of Christ. You know, we are brothers. We are sisters. See? Interesting point there. But you say, well, then, Brian, you're saying that we're no longer commanded to honor father and mother, right? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. This is a big thing with the uh, Omelic cult. They will quote this thing as, as a, uh, you know, you don't dare try to get out of the cult because if you do, we'll take your parents from you. We'll, we'll have them shun 
you and, and then you're dishonoring your father and mother, so therefore you're not right with God and you've lost your salvation. Um, you need to read the entire passage there and look at the context. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Okay? Um, it's funny because I, I heard that the Amish will actually say that the first commandment is to honor thy father and mother. Uh, that's not what the passage says. Verse 2, which is the first commandment with promise. What's the promise? That it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. That's the promise that comes along with honoring your parents. But let me ask you a question. How is, honoring, how is it honoring to your parents to put down the book? How is that showing honor to them? If you have lost parents or professing Christian parents that are lost, <laughs> um, you know, they're, they're saved and going to hell. You know, as I saw, uh, James Melton has a track like that, which is pretty good. But lost parents, um, and they tell you, put the book away. You shouldn't be so dogmatic. You shouldn't be a Bible thumper. You shouldn't be this. You shouldn't be that. And you put this away. Um, How is that honoring them? And compromising your standards and doing things that you know are wrong so that you can honor them? I mean, think about the logic behind this. Um, I'm going to sit down in front of television because that's what my parents do. And I'm going to destroy my mind and wreck my mind. And if you have children, I'm going to wreck their minds because that's what grandma and grandpa are doing. And that way I'll live long on the earth. No, that doesn't work. Okay. We are never to abandon the standards of Scripture. And if your parents are telling you to abandon the standards of Scripture, you cannot listen to them. And by doing that, it, by saying, I'm not going to do that, that is true honor. Why? You're telling them the truth. I mean, if your parents are eating food that's giving them cancer and doing things that's giving them cancer, and you say, I don't want to dishonor them by being mean to them or saying, hey, you should stop doing that, uh, is that really honor? No, that's dishonor. Why? You're withholding truth from them. You see? See how that thing works? Turn next to 2 Timothy. Second Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Here's some signs of the end times, the iniquity abounding that we read about in Matthew chapter 24, verse 12. It says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such Continue being around them and get along. Put aside your differences. Oh, wait, it doesn't say that. It says, from such, turn away. You say, well, then, okay, this is a contradiction because it says there, disobedience to, disobedient to parents, that's a bad thing. But then down here it says, uh, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. So you have family members, you have parents that like to watch television and bad things that are on there that are contrary to Scripture. You know, so they love pleasure more than they love God. But then how can we say, I don't want to watch that without being disobedient to parents? Um, well, when the Bible talks about this thing of obeying your parents, it's talking to children. That's the context of Ephesians chapter 6. It's talking about children. Right? It's not talking about you as an adult. When you are fully grown and you're saved and you know what's going on, you're not going to submit yourself and just say, oh, whatever my dad and my mom want. Oh, okay, that's wrong. If, they, if what they want and what they desire is in line with Scripture, okay, fine. But when they start to depart from Scripture and they try to pull you away from Scripture, no, 
No, no. It doesn't work that way. And, you know, I just need to make this point here. Nowhere in, in the entire New Testament is a saved Christian ever told to submit themselves to a parent or to any other relative for that matter. Okay, nowhere is that ever taught. All right. Um, when you're a child and things and when you've, you've not, you're not, you know, old enough to go out on your own, uh, yeah, there's a sense where you have to do some things that your parents say and, and you might not like it and whatever else, but, you know, pray for them and, and just try to stay away from, you know, if they're, if they're forcing you to watch TV, well, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that, but they might, uh, you might have to live in their home till you're old enough to get out on your own. And I know that that can be very rough sometimes. I know that there are, are saved uh, young people that uh, come here to YouTube and, and you listen to the sermons and your whole family is lost, and that's a rough thing. Uh, and certainly we pray for those that are like that. I mean, that's, that's tough. But uh, use the time to try and study your Bible and, and, you know, go to your room, try to stay separate from that whole mess as much as you can, and pray. You know, uh, the Lord will, uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 28, you know, keep that verse in mind. But now let's next go to Proverbs chapter 23. You know, the real quick story here that I told in the first time I, I did this uh, study. <clears throat> um, my in-laws uh, came last June, and the study that I did was actually not too long after that. Uh, this exact study here and uh, we had them come here and I mean we bent over backwards for them and and they are lost they are self-righteous Lutherans uh, Lutherics as my wife likes to say mixing Lutheran with Catholic which is very accurate because the Lutherans are you know un officially under Catholicism again they've signed agreements and things like that but uh, these Lutheric cultists came here and uh, you know we did everything we could to try and be honorable to them and um, <clears throat> I mean it's just crazy the things that we did and uh, you know I could just see this controlling uh, bewitching spirit in my mother-in-law her name is Marie Kutra and um, and of course she runs her husband Lyle and uh, I could see this thing and it was just like it was getting worse you know I go to get some some silverware out of the drawer and it's like the the silverware tray is flipped around and I'm just like and I looked at her and she just kind of looked at me like no oh, you know what you know oh, oh, da, 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 you know and 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 I'm just like seeing this thing of stuff you know in my home starting to be turned and, and moved and things and I'm like you know I mean they did this before another time that that uh, we were visiting with them it was like you know like I'm an idiot or something and I don't know how to run my own home and of course they've you know, were abusive and put down my wife all the time that she was being raised. It was just absurd. So, you know, I, you know, they treat her like she's no good. And then they come here and I'm an idiot too now, apparently. So I'm in working on my computer and uh, my wife and uh, my mother-in-law are out in the kitchen and an argument got started and she put a, a you know, a plastic uh, spatula into boiling hot water, which you don't do. I mean, there's BPA and stuff like this. I mean, you don't, you know, it's, you know, bisphenol A, if you don't know what that means. It's a, it's a synthetic female hormone that's in a lot of plastic. It's really bad for you. You don't want to boil plastic. So my wife yelled at her. She said, whoa, what are you doing? You know, don't put that in there. Get that out of there. And my mother-in-law uh, used profanity. You know, she knows what I do for a living. She, I mean, walking right past all this and stuff. I mean, she knows I'm a preacher. And I said, I got up from the computer and I yelled and I said, whoa. And I said, you do not use profanity in my home. Well, she went into a little Jezebel hissy fit, throwing a temper tantrum and crying and screaming. We're leaving. We're leaving. We're leaving. We can't take this. I, you know, and stuff, all this stuff just went crazy, you know, and they grabbed their belongings and they got in their vehicle. And she said, you know, oh, I, I'll hug you as before. I said, don't even, don't, don't even go there, okay? And she, she cried. Oh, I figured you'd say that, you know. And it was this whole big fun thing. I'm sure none of you have ever experienced any of the thing like this, you know. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's a whole big thing. 
and they left. I didn't even tell them to leave. You know, I didn't even say, get out of here. I just said, you're not going to use profanity in my home. So they go, you know, nice big blow up. And, you know, we get this letter. Oh, and she says, you know, as they're leaving, she goes, maybe you'll hear from us and maybe you won't. And I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, that's not a threat really. But, uh, you know, it's more like really. But, you know, so we get this letter, you know, and I, th I was just like, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. And I kind of pretty much had it figured out what was going to happen. And sure enough, we get this letter uh, a week or so later. And, and it's, uh, you know, we're sorry, you know, that things happened. There was fault on both parts and stuff like this. And I'm going, that's exactly what I thought was going to happen. They will not lower their pride enough to say we were wrong. And you know what they want? They want me to conform to them. She runs her husband and she wants to run me. And she wants to turn my wife into herself junior. You know, that's not going to happen. My wife is saved. She has the Holy Spirit within her saying, don't be a feminist to your husband. Don't control him like your mother controls your father. My wife is not going to do that. And I'm not saying, you know, I don't beat my wife and stuff and force her to submit to me. Oh, no. She does it because the Holy Spirit lives within her and convicts her and says, do things the way my word says. That's why. She does it of her own free will. She's submissive to me of her own free will. You know, and that's why it's supposed to be, by the way. I mean, ladies out there, do what the Bible says. It isn't about some system that men created or whatever else. Hey, what does the Bible say? I mean, look through the Bible and read the, the, the parts of Scripture like Esther and Ruth, two books that are written and named after the women that, you know, are in, you know, the main characters of the book and learn from their example. You know, read about Sarah, Abraham's wife, and so a lot of these other great women, the Proverbs 31 woman, you know, the famous passage there, you know, learn from those things. And... Again, if you have some kind of a controlling, demeaning relative that's trying to, to control you, and that's really what the whole thing's about. You know, they, they want to control us, and it ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. You know? I mean, if you can't come here and respect my beliefs as the head of this home, then you have no business being here. You have no place here. I mean, you know, you can't even keep your stupid profanity out of your mouth for a couple days. So, whatever. And let me just show you another little thing here real quickly, just to kind of illustrate my point I'm trying to make. Um, I heard about this thing in the Church of the Wells down in, in Wells, Texas. It's supposedly this, like, uh, non-501c3, King James Bible-believing, almost like a house church type of a thing. And, you know... I, it's it's probably some a bunch of Jesuits, you know, these young men that are running the thing, and they're they're raising this thing up to make, you know, Bible believers look like crazy nuts. You know, those of us that don't go to Bible buildings anymore, and uh, you know, it's interesting because they I checked out their website, and they had a whole thing about the sin of presumption, that you know you can't believe and you can't under, you can't know that you are saved until after you die, just like a Catholic would write. You know, you have to die in a state of grace. They're Catholics, is all that they are, trying to masquerade as Bible-believing, non-501c3 house church Christians. I mean, it, they're, Satan is counterfeiting so much of what we do. I mean, he's got Stephen Anderson, you know, counterfeiting, you know, Bible-believing Christians, and, and uh, Martin Richling counterfeiting dispensational believers, and now the Church of Wells is now, you know, trying to counterfeit house church Christians. I mean, it's, whatever. Know your Bible, you know, you won't fall for this stuff, but... One of the things that's said in this in this ABC, I think it is report, yeah, ABC News. One of the things that they say is that there's this young couple and they had a, a little baby girl and she's not doing too good and then she ends up dying. And, you know, the uh, I guess the in-laws of the, the husband, you know, they're like saying about how that they're so sad that, you know, this happened. And but but listen to what she says here. I'm going to play part of this video. Listen to this. In their report, the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services stated that there was reason to believe that the death of baby Faith was due to medical neglect on the part of her parents. That was all two years ago, but last month, 
a grand jury chose not to indict anyone. I felt betrayed by the, by the legal system because I, I felt like there was no justice. Okay, so you had the mother-in-law, and she goes, you know, she, earlier in the video, I don't play this part, but earlier in the video, she's like, we just love them, we just, we just want to be around them, and they, they won't even talk to us anymore, and, and, and oh, if we could just talk to them, and we just want to tell them that we love them, and then she's like, oh, you know, the grand jury acquitted them of any wrongdoing, I mean, they lost their daughter, give them a break, you know, and, and the grand jury, you know, uh, they, they acquitted them, and we just felt like there wasn't any justice done. You see what's going on? These people, oh, you're, you're in a religious cult. Uh, you know, we ought to really turn you into the law. And, and, and if you do something wrong and you lose your baby, well, you should, be, you should be condemned and put in prison. And we want that because we love you. Don't you understand? This is best for you. You know, I mean, you don't have health insurance and, and you don't have, uh, you know, 501c3 incorporation and, and, and you're not meeting in an established church and you don't have friends and, and, and we're going to have to turn you into the, the Department of Homeland Security because you're terrorists. But really, it's, it's because we love you. You know, I got that from my older brother. You know, we're, uh, we had this whole mix-up thing, this whole ruckus thing with my, uh, with my parents, you know. <laughs> and uh, and it, my brother's like, God's going to be, you know, you're going to answer for this and God's going to be uh, destroying you soon or something like this. And I'm going, and he's like, it's because I love you. And I'm like, what? You know, you're threatening me and this is the love of God, you know? Okay. And you see, this thing is increasing all the time. And you get these families, oh, we just, we love them so much. And, and if they don't come home soon, we're going to turn them over to the law, you know? <laughs> and then there's this couple in here that they got this uh, daughter who ironically, her name is Catherine, you know, and they remind me exactly, I mean, if you want to see what my in-laws are like, Lyle and Marie Kutra, watch this ABC thing about the Church of Wells and look at Catherine's parents. That's my in-laws, a carbon copy of them, you know. I mean, the mother dressing like she's a teenager and everything and modestly and all this other stuff and, and just, oh, we just want her to come home and we love her and she's, she was devoutly religious and we're devoutly religious and everything and, and you know, and the, and the daughter's like, just, I don't want to be around them. They're controlling. You know, my wife and I can relate. So it just, see, and I know so many of you have written to me. And you, and you write and you're just like, I get this family members and they're like, you know, I say to them, you know, the Bible says whatever on some subject. And it's just like, they're like, how could you talk that way to me? Don't you know, we're family. Just like you're supposed to drop the Bible and say, oh, I forgot. I forgot you're my brother. I forgot you're my sister. Silly me. Let me just burn my King James Bible so we can have a good family get together. In fact, let's burn the Bible and roast marshmallows on it and sing songs. And then we'll have a good fa happy family. <laughs> I can't get it out. You know, it's insanity. I'm not giving up the Bible. Okay? You know, it's like the the, you know, I saw the thing Charlton Heston years ago, you know, this NRA deal, and he's like holding up a gun and he's like, from my cold dead hand, you know, well, there's a weapon, but let me tell you, really, in reality, this thing, from my cold dead hand, you're not getting the King James Bible from me. You know why? Because this is the key to sanity. If I didn't believe in this book, I'd be insane. I'd, I'd start doing drugs or something, drinking alcohol or whatever. This book is absolute truth. You ain't going to get it out of my hands. I don't think so. Oh, but, but we're family. <laughs> I don't care. Uh, I'm going to live by the book. I know what Jesus Christ did for me, and there's not one family member that would do the same. Thank you very much. But let's look here. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 19 through 26. Hear thou, my son, and be wise, and guide thine heart in the way. Be not among wine-bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh. Kind of sounds like a lot of family get-togethers around the holidays. Holidays, excuse me. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. 
Hearken unto thy father that begat thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. Okay? And of course, I'm not advising that. I'm not saying you should turn on your parents and just hate their guts. But if they are forcing you to become worldly in order to be in their presence, I'm sorry. We can't be together. You're causing me to go against my beliefs as a Christian. I can't do that. Look at verse 23. Remember the Bible talks about counting the cost? You know? Jesus talked about that. Verse 23. Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee shall rejoice. My son, give me thine heart, and let thine eyes observe my ways. Okay? You see, the sad part about it is, there are some families, members, that are never going to get saved. You say, well, then how are they going to rejoice over the Bible, the fact that you stuck with the Bible? They'll rejoice because if they do not get saved and they die in their sins, they're going to end up at the great white throne judgment. And they're going to see you up there, seated at the right hand of the Lord over there with all the other saints and they're going to say, well, at least I can rejoice that they got it right. You see, every man, woman, every man and woman, I should say, because children, if they're under the age of accountability, they go to heaven, but every man and woman is going to give an account before God someday. Everyone. That's why you have to make sure to... Uh, Buy the truth and sell it not. You need to give up your Bible for family unity. Sorry. What? You mean you would put a book before your family? Yes. Absolutely. Can I tell you about the book? Can I tell you why this book is so important to me? Can I show you the truth? No, we don't want that book in our presence. Okay, dad, mom, brother, sister, I'll see you around. You say, well, O'Brien, I don't, I don't think I can do a thing like that, that you can't be the, a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's as simple as that. This book is black and white when it comes to sin. This book condemns certain things and says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. How can you compromise? You can't. If you expect to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you can't compromise. Finally, let's turn to Romans chapter 12, verse 18. Romans chapter 12, verse 18. Another good rule for you as a Christian. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. There are times and places that, yes, you can be around relatives. You can, you can go and you can visit with people and things like this. And they have the TV shut off or they have other offensive things not around or, or whatever else. Um, if it's possible... Yeah, live peaceably with them. Okay, fine. But if it gets to a point where you are forced into a decision of I have to be with my family, or if I want to be with my family rather, I'm going to have to give up my beliefs. I'm going to have to compromise. I'm going to have to sit there and hear some really foul stuff or not be with my family. You go with not being with your family. That's the right thing to do. And I'm telling you, it's quite unfortunate, but as time goes by, that list of uh, iniquities that abound is getting a lot bigger. It's getting a whole lot bigger. Really, really something to think about, brethren. Because like I said, I know a lot of you struggle with this thing. 
I know I've, I've gotten letters and things and people say, don't write back. I don't want my family to know that I'm writing to a Christian ministry or whatever else. Hey, man, there's problems out there. There are issues. And my advice is you need to keep a couple things in mind. First of all, keep in mind everyone is going to stand before God someday. And they're going to be judged by a standard of truth. Right here. This is the standard truth. The sword that Jesus Christ came. The sword that brings division. All right? Keep that in mind. The second thing that you need to keep in mind if you are saved is the fact that your brothers and sisters, your real family, are those that do the will of your Heavenly Father. That's your real family. And uh, brethren, time is short. It's real short. And we're going to be meeting up in the clouds one day, you know. And um, I told this, gave this little analogy in my former study. I remember it now from from this from looking at these notes and things. I don't actually have it written in the notes, but I remember this. Um, have you ever, if you've ever gone to an airport and flown anywhere, you know that they come over the loudspeaker and and everything and and. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll do this thing and they'll say, you know, Flight 77, you know, departing in a half hour. You know, and then you hear a little bit after that, and, you know, I'll do, even do the sound effect, you know, Flight 77, departing in 15 minutes. You know, a little while later, Flight 77 is now loading in Gate A, A7 or something like that, you know, whatever. You know, well, I can tell you, brethren, um, our flight out of here as Christians is rapidly approaching and the family that you're going to have is your heavenly family number one make sure you get on that flight you don't want to be left behind number two make sure that you are exhorting the other passengers that are going to be on that flight and if you can live peaceably with your family your lost family members if you can be around them and witness to them and be there and, and, and try to get them to get on the flight? Okay, good. But if they are abounding in iniquity and their love is starting to wax cold and they're become, becoming a threat to you and starting to threaten you and give those nice little veiled threats of, it's for your safety. We care about you. And you see they're trying to control your life and trying to turn you away from the Word of God. You better run from them. You better get away from them. So let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I, I really do pray, Lord, for strength out there <clears throat> for the, uh, my brothers and sisters in Christ that struggle with this thing of, of feelings and emotions for their family members, Lord, and, and, uh, but yet understanding what your word says about the standards that we're supposed to have. I just really pray, Lord, for discernment for the body of Christ. And I pray that we would be able to stand no matter what it costs us and to be your disciples and to love your word more and more as time goes by. As, as things get darker, Lord, to, to uh, stand more for your word. And Lord, I just uh, I pray that you would give each of us opportunities to witness. And uh, I know I had a brother right here this past week and, and really it was a convicting comment and he said I just needed to take some time off from YouTube get away from all the comment wars back and forth and actually get out there and do what uh, I'm supposed to do and that is to pass out tracts and to witness to the lost and get DVDs out to people and do what a Christian is supposed to do that's looking forward to the rapture and I pray Lord that the our my other brothers and sisters in Christ out there, Lord, would be challenged and that we would all consider the our true family that's in heaven, the family that's made up of saints. And I just uh, pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, that's going to be it. Lord willing, the audio turned out this time, unlike the last time. Uh, just, you know, I know that, you know, I've been from doing these Amish studies, you know, they use this thing of shunning, you know, they, they shun family members and it's a very powerful tool 
to have family problems and to have family that turns on one another. It's, it's, it's one of the most horrible things that you can go through. You know, it's one thing to have the world turn on you. It's another thing to have family turn on you. Um, it can be rough at times, brethren, but uh, this is what counts. And someday every member of your family is going to stand before God, saved or lost. If they're saved, they're going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ. If they're lost, it's going to be the great white throne judgment. And we're all going to be judged by the standard, the standard of truth. Make sure that you're on the right side. That'll be it. We'll see you next week. Thank you for watching.